Public-private partnerships, often referred to as P3s, have re-emerged and have been in vogue since the 1980s. Increasingly, you as managers and the directing minds of public, private, or not-for-profit organizations are going to encounter the opportunity to consider participating in such ventures. Indeed, I would be surprised if many of you listening to this podcast have not already encountered a P3 in your endeavors. Accordingly, I thought it might be helpful to share at a very high level some concepts, notions, and thoughts I have acquired as a practitioner in this field over the years. As we get underway, let me underscore that the decision whether or not to adopt a public-private partnership, a P3 model, must be based solely on evidence and not rhetoric. So what is a P3? Public-private partnerships are legal agreements between government, private, or not-for-profit entities to collectively provide public infrastructure, community facilities, and or related services. As we will note, typically the partners share the risks, responsibilities, and the rewards of mutually shared investment. The question and challenge, of course, is the division of risk between the partners. The national champion for P3s is the Canadian Council on Public-Private Partnerships. For over a decade, this association has been the leading proponent for many of the world's largest private sector entities in promoting the synergies of P3s. A formal definition of a P3 provided by the Council as a cooperative venture between public and private sectors built on the expertise of each partner that best meets clearly the defined public needs through the appropriate allocation of resources, risks, and rewards. Are P3s of this nature something new? No, P3s were not even new when reintroduced by Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher and President Ronald Reagan in the early 1980s. The combinations and permutations of the partnership arrangements possible between government and the private sector number in the dozens. They involve around some components of the private sector being asked to either design, build, finance, or operate, or even own the facility. The crafting of the appropriate partnership entails assigning risks and costs on an equitable basis. The private sector requires, among other things, a return on investment, while the public sector's paramount concerns tend to be transparency and that the P3 must not bring the government into disrepute. A variety of P3 models have been widely adopted globally to undertake primarily investment infrastructure. Googling the topic will provide you almost three and a half million sites. Here are some examples. In Britain, the private sector has invested to date $47 billion in P3s as a result of partnering in over 500 projects. 200 of these ventures are operational with another 300 P3s in progress. In British Columbia, there are several recent projects to include the Fraser Health Authority who adopted a P3 model to build, finance, and operate the health center in Abbotsford at a cost in excess of $200 million. The recent Olympic Games in Vancouver used P3s to provide a 20 kilometer rapid transit line from Richmond Airport to Vancouver at a cost of $1.7 billion. Global leaders in public-private partnerships. If you're considering P3s, their successes and failures, three countries stand out as world leaders in number and in scale. The United Kingdom, Australia, and the United States, the latter primarily in water and wastewater. Although many countries have successfully implemented P3 projects, and are benefiting from the results. What tends to distinguish the lead countries, UK and Australia, is that P3 activities are conducted through a comprehensive government program rather than a one-off basis, as we have tended to do here in Canada and in the United States. However, I sense we are increasingly moving towards a similar comprehensive government program in some areas. Public-private partnerships are a hybrid between the traditional legal contract and a partnership. In crafting your P3 agreement, you must undertake a stakeholder analysis whereby you classify the four types of stakeholders and develop strategies for dealing with each classification. How will you get them involved to support the initiative 
or at very least not to impede the initiative. In crafting this hybrid model, you'll identify a number of points of tension between stakeholders. Each group will have a different agenda. For example, the private sector partner will be heavily concerned, and rightfully so, about the return on investment. The public sector partner, while concerned about the financial questions, will in all probability be more concerned about the optics, the outcomes, and that the project as a whole does not bring the public sector entity into disrepute. Above all, the minister cannot be embarrassed. The stakeholders, such as unions, etc., will also have concerns that will have to be addressed in a collaborative, partnering way. A challenge? Yes, but P3s are being undertaken daily with success. Unlike a fixed contract, a P3 partnership encourages almost a Japanese Kaizen model for improvements on the project. It may well be, for example, the private sector partner in the course of building the project identifies significant cost savings in materials or design that if the public sector partner approves the change would result in significant profits or an accelerated delivery date. Unlike the contract model, the partners in a P3 would encourage each other to adopt the new adjustments and to work out equitably some incentive for both parties for doing so. The key is to create a cooperative coalition with positive results for all partners. There is a need to adopt new mental models. What do I need to do to help you achieve your outcomes? What do you need to do for me to achieve my positive outcomes? It is a matter of making sure everybody wins and that no one is forgotten. It must result in a win-win outcome rather than a win-lose mental model. Finally, make sure you establish in your P3s what positive indicators outcomes will demonstrate your venture's success. Negotiating a public-private partnership as a result of a request for proposals is a significant task. As we have noted earlier, the key tension in these negotiations will be between the financial focus of the private sector versus the strong focus of the public sector on not bringing the ministry into disrepute. Remember to view the contract from the lenses of your partners. There is a wide range of risk strategies that you'll need to know if you're participating in this aspect of a P3. In addition to risk management, there are a number of legal aspects you'll have to have clarification. The least of which is to ensure your contract provides an exit plan, a prenup. In most cases, dissolution is triggered by failing to achieve one or more of the performance requirements within the contract. The failure to achieve these performance requirements, milestones, provide for the dissolution of the partnership. Further, P3s, upon such dissolution, must provide, for example, how will the research and development, the assets, etc., be divided among the partners. I propose in the fullness of time to prepare separate papers and podcasts on these items. As a P3 consultant, I'm of the opinion that P3s have limited application. A strong case can be made to adopt a P3 for highways, hotels, hospitals, bridges, sky trains, and a number of other ventures. There is evidence to support successful ventures globally in these areas. P3s are not suitable in other ventures. For example, the general application of the delivery of health. Britain adopted P3s in support of their acute care system with disastrous results. There is evidence, however, to support the notion that small boutique components of the healthcare industry can effectively be served by P3s. The underlying rationale, it seems to me, for P3s in large part results from government being asked to provide more services with less money. If that is true, then it would seem to follow that the public sector money is better used providing goods and services to those citizens who are not able to access these goods and services in rural communities. For example, consider Canada's CBC. Half a century ago, it made sense to unite the nation and to share national stories. Today, with the internet and the proliferation of media to urban centers, one might question whether or not the CBC could operate on a reduced budget and focus on the providing services only to Canada's north and other outback regions rather than compete toe-to-toe -to -toe in well-served urban centers. It is expenditures such as these that Canada's decision-makers must focus upon as we move forward 
with less public sector or not-for-profit funding. Some projects we might consider are hospitals, health care, schools, transportation, water, wastewater, prisons, military, yes, military, even the Blackwater Organization uh, from America in the Middle East, uh, yes, and even Royal Roads University. A caveat, however, whatever the project to be adopted or lack of adoption of the P3, remember it cannot be solely based on ideology. Here are seven major functions and a few initial thoughts that might be considered in a public-private partnership. Design. Often the private sector has currency and the depth to provide state-of-the-art designs. Second, building. Building of infrastructure and projects generally favor the public sector contractors. Third, financing. P3s are a way to borrow money for public capital projects. The issue here, of course, is who can borrow the money on the market cheaper? In some jurisdictions, contractors are able to borrow cheaper than public sector entities. This is not true in Canada. The other four, in my opinion, work best as public-private partnership ventures. That would be the operation and maintenance. Certainly there is much evidence to support the notion that the private sector, providing there are strong controls and sanctions maintained by the public sector, work well here. The fifth, leasebacks, is also a good model for P3s in order to help secure financing. Here, the private sector building the building, if they're able to obtain a rental agreement from the public sector, financing can easily be established. The sixth one is transfer. After the private sector partner has received the agreed upon return on investment achieved over a period of years, it is generally desirable that the assets be transferred back to the public sector. And the final one is ownership. This requires transparency and reflective thought if the public sector is going to divest public assets to the private sector. Negotiating P3s, it is important to observe the following core principles. First, the protection of the public interest. Second, that value for money must be achieved. Third, that there's the appropriate public control and ownership provided within the agreement. Fourth, that there is accountability. And finally, that the process is fair, transparent, and an efficient process. You are only limited by your imagination when structuring the deal. That sounds like Donald Trump, doesn't it? You might consider joint ventures, licensing, management contracts that may or may not include a turnkey operation, user pay models, where some part of the costs are borne all or in part by government, Consider the form of government contributions do not necessarily have to be in cash. The public sector proposed a very innovative approach to building a new bridge across Vancouver Harbor. Here, the developer suggested that if they were allowed to fill in a number of acres of water within the harbor, they would build the much needed bridge free of all costs to government as they would derive their funds to pay for the bridge and make a return on investment from the sale of the newly created waterfront real estate. Consider another example, that every time an overpass cloverleaf is constructed on a major highway, it develops four very attractive corners, highly prized by developers. The sale of these corners can be used to offset the cost of the highway interchange. It requires reflective and creative thought. Governments might also give a one-time grant to attract private investors to assist in funding the project. There may be revenue subsidies provided to meet the necessary price points of the operation, for example, in setting of bridge fares. Tax breaks are often considered as well as guarantees by the public sector that the annual revenue the private sector operator will receive will be met. As I commented earlier, you're only limited by your imagination. What is the rationale? Why do it? What is clear, for example, is that British Columbia finds its ministries have to do more with less. A quick examination of a bar chart provided in the slides that accompany this podcast provide the budget twin towers and the projection of diminishing government services. When I get a moment, I'll update the bar chart. 
but I'm comfortable to suggest that the ratios remain relatively the same. If anything, possibly greater weight to health and education with respect to public funding. As you can see, the consumption of public sector funds leaves little for all other ministries. Over the years, British Columbia has had to cut costs, provided wage freezes, and combined significant increases in user fees, and it has still managed to grow these towers. Tax fatigue has set in. Accordingly, it comes as no big surprise that BC ministries are seeking ways to attract public-private funding to support much of the needed infrastructure. But this new fiscal reality is not just within the province of British Columbia, it is global. Indeed, the global meltdown of 2008 has accelerated increased reliance on P3s. Take a look at the United States debt clock for a moment, and I am confident you will agree that they must rely on other options to fund infrastructure projects. There is just no more money. A number of U.S. states, in particular California, find themselves in the same position. Take a moment and look at the U.S. debt clock. Over $14 trillion. Over 95% of Americans' GMP and rising. Crazy. Little choice but to consider new approaches to building infrastructure and providing goods and services. As a result of globalization, all nations to some degree or another have developed economic interdependence on other nations. Like mountaineers, we are all tied at the waist. When one falls into the financial crevasse, the question becomes, can the others on the line hold? It is a global spider web where one tug on any part of the web distorts the relationship to others on the web. Not just Canada and United States, consider the European Union, save and except Germany. They do not have the funds to provide goods and services demand. They too are requiring increasing consideration be given to P3 models. So governments, as we've just discussed, given their financial condition, are attempting to find ways to portray the nation's and provincial financial affairs in the most positive light. P3s provide the opportunity to expand capital spending at a time when there's a need for infrastructure without appearing to be spending more. P3s play the role of off-book accounting as other mechanisms have played in the past in keeping capital spending out of the annual spending budgets and off debt clocks. So continuing with our discussion of why do it, as we've said, governments around the world are focusing on new ways to finance projects, to build infrastructure, and deliver demanded services. P3s can provide much needed capital to finance government programs and projects, thereby freeing public funds for core economic and social programs. Another reason is the cost of borrowing. It's shifting the borrowing from the public sector to the private sector. The P3 approach provides creative ways to build that may not be affordable by the public sector alone at this particular time. It also provides the public sector with an opportunity to introduce complementary services that often fall outside the government's mandate. Another is that the P3 projects strive to achieve maximum value for the taxpayer by taking an innovative approach to design, construction, finance, operations, and or the maintenance of the public facility. Another one is that they also provide the opportunity for risk sharing, whereby risks such as managing costs, controlling the quality, staying on schedule, are transferred to the party best suited to manage them. The key benefits for P3s for citizens are the ability to access new state-of-the-art infrastructure, faster design and construction, projects that will reflect the citizens' priorities. It'll help stimulate economic growth and employment. It minimizes the impact on residents' taxes. It frees up public funds for other core services, such as the CBC example we have discussed. Here are the key benefits of P3s for the public sector shares risk and responsibility with private sector partners, addresses key issues such as multiple demands, high expectations, and pressure to reduce debt, accesses new source of fundings with new specialized skills, delivers capital projects building an infrastructure faster, 
reallocates resources to core areas, increases efficiency and effectiveness, creates high quality infrastructure, promotes transparency, accountability, and in-depth cost-benefit analysis and scrutiny of proponents offering the best value, allocates risk to the partner best equipped to manage them, obtains private sector investment in public sector infrastructure, and finally, enhances competitiveness. The key benefits of P3s for the private sector are a steady revenue stream linked to secure contracts, new business opportunities, the potential to build on the expertise of government organizations, the sharing of risks, and they can move the project faster at times, such as obtaining environmental approvals and zoning, etc., that the public sector are able to contribute as a partner. There are generally two golden threads running through public-private partnership contracts. The first is that generally the cost will be borne by the users, and secondly, new technology and innovation drives the adoption of P3s. For example, today, with the advent of computer chips, it is possible to do electric tolling on bridges. No longer do cars have to stop as they traverse across the bridge, but electronically their fee is noted by the computer and some form of billing is generated. Certainly, with the advent of new technology, airport security has driven new public partnerships between airport authorities and security services. Been frisked lately? Is there agreement on the value of public-private partnerships? My research and experience tells me yes. It crystallizes on a few singular points. That public-private partnerships should be limited to projects delivering greater value for money than other forms of procurement. Governments can contract the provision of quality services using this model. Transfer of significant share of risks to the private sector is possible. P3s and the implementation of can provide the presence of competition or incentive-based regulations. They can also provide sound institutional and legal framework. They can provide a sufficient level of technical expertise in the government to manage the relationship and government can provide the proper disclosure of the P3 commitments along with government guarantees in government financial statements and in their debt and sustainability analysis. As I noted earlier in the podcast, there are dozens of models of public-private partnerships. Here are some. A design build. Here the public sector designs and builds the infrastructure to meet the public sector performance specifications, often for a fixed price, so the risk of cost overruns is transferred to the private sector. Many do not consider the design build to be within the spectrum of a P3. The next one is an operation and maintenance contract, an O&M. A private operator under a contract operates a publicly owned asset for a specific term. Ownership of the asset remains with the public entity. The next is a design, build, finance and operate. The private sector designs, finances, constructs a new facility under a long-term lease and operates the facility during the term of the lease. The private sector partner transfers the new facility to the public sector at the end of the lease term. Another model is the build, own, and operate, a boo. The private sector finances, builds, owns, and operates the facility or service in perpetuity. The public constraints are stated in the original agreement and through ongoing regulatory authority. Build, own, operate, and transfer a boot is another model. Here, a private entity receives a franchise to finance, design, build, and operate a facility and to charge user fees for a specific period, after which ownership is transferred back to the public sector. A buy, build, operate model is one where transfer of the public asset to the private or quasi-public entity, usually under contract, that assets are to be upgraded and operated for a specific period of time. Public control is exercised through the contract at the time of transfer. Royal Roads would follow closely this model. Another model is the operating license. A private operator received a license or right to operate a public service, usually for a specific term. This is often used in IT projects. Another model is finance only. A private entity usually a financial services company, funds a project directly or uses various mechanisms such as long-term leases or a bond issue. 
the terms used in P3s that you'll encounter. A request for expressions of interest, an RFEI, or an RFQ, a request for qualifications, or an RFP, request for proposals. There are many others that you'll have to acquire a lexicon. I have included in the PowerPoints that accompany this podcast a scale of public-private partnerships. The options available for delivery of public infrastructure range from design-build to outright privatization, where the government transfers all responsibilities, risks, and rewards for service delivery to the private sector. Within this broad spectrum, public-private partnerships can be categorized on the extent of the public and private sector involvement and the degree of risk allocation. This simplified spectrum of public-private partnership models used in Canada are reflected on this slide. They have been prepared by the Council for Public-Private Partnerships. A little more on what the literature and research says on public-private partnerships. Overall, the research suggests that bundling of contracts are preferable when there is room for high-powered incentives to innovate or improve infrastructure before the operational phase. More recent studies have focused on, among other things, the level of details in the contract, the presence of private financing with the senior investors acting as monitors, the essence of cost overruns, that is the cost associated with trying to make the contracts complete, and the need for careful review of contracts and the usefulness of properly designed auctions, all are areas of study. I would recommend that bureaucrats with a mandate whether or not to adopt a P3 project develop a flowchart of the total business process. Understand how that component considered for P3 interfaces with the other components in the value chain or supply chain. For example, if BC Ferries or some part thereof was to be considered a P3 candidate, then the decision maker must examine the integration and coordination in the complete British Columbia intermodal transportation system. Is the component under consideration a core competency of the transportation system? If so, a P3 would be difficult to support. However, if the alternative routes are available, then further examination of the P3 candidate should be considered. A further consideration is the requirement for decision makers to undertake a life cycle approach to capital management. This means linking all of the capital expenditures and the operating costs for the life of the project and fully costing before committing to a P3. This is one of the troubling constraints of proceeding with commuter rail projects. The full operating costs must be considered. At the end of the day, the projects being considered must be evidence-based and not reflect the rhetorical philosophies of private sectors, unions, and government officials. The test I would commend is what is in the best interest of taxpayers. Are P3s good or bad? It depends on Plato or Aristotle. By 2007, one-fifth of the public services in the UK valued at 60 billion pounds were delivered in the private and volunteer sectors. Once P3s get a foothold, they're very difficult to dislodge. It is a slippery slope. My advice would be, in arriving at a determination whether a P3 is a good or a bad initiative, you must be aware of your bias towards the political philosophy of Plato, collectivism, one for all, all for one, the state over the individual, vis-a-vis -vis Aristotle's political philosophy, enhanced by the economic philosophies of Adam Smith, John Stuart Mills, David Ricardo, and others, that place the individual over the interests of the state. If you do not allow for this bias in your decision, then your decision will be skewed. Those opposed to public-private partnerships most often cite the loss of public control that occurs when a private sector company is involved in financing, building, or delivering public services. Compared to other countries with vibrant P3 activities, the political culture of Canada is often seen as a barrier to further progress on P3s, especially in such areas as healthcare and when delivering such public goods as water. Canada remains suspect of partnerships that put shareholder value above the public interest. Public-private partnerships are often seen by organized labor as resulting in job losses 
poor quality, and lack of oversight. Do these criticisms of public-private partnerships have merit? Well, it depends on the terrain upon which you're standing. You must undertake a stakeholder analysis. For example, consider the terrain the union stands on when highways, ferries, or computer services are considered for our public-private partnerships. Unions will contend P3s are like outright privatization. They change the control of the public service. And like contracting out, they change the way the public services are delivered. Further, a P3 will drive a wedge between the public services and their delivery, creating a category of services that are still public services, but which are privately delivered. Aware of your stakeholders' concern, your task as a decision maker is to craft a strategy that will minimize the impact or exploit the opportunity to these particular stakeholders that they present to the venture. Again, be aware of your biases, Plato or Aristotle, when you formulate your strategy. A recent Canadian Council publication entitled 100 Projects Selected by the Public-Private Partnerships Across Canada shows that P3s have become a successful vehicle to deliver public services in over 25 distinct sectors at all levels of government. Canada has many high-profile projects such as the Confederation Bridge, Highway 407 Electronic Toll Route, Moncton's Water Treatment Sewerage Plant, St. Lawrence Seaway Commercialization, Kelowna Skyweach Place, and Bruce Nuclear Power Plant Lease. Here are some projected values of Canadian P3s currently completed. In 2008, there were 14 projects that reached a financial close with a total agreement value of $5.3 billion. From 1998 to 2008, the total was in the order of $28.4 billion. The sectors that these public-private partnerships operated within were the landfill and recycling, water and wastewater treatment, hospitals, justice and corrections, recreation and culture, public transit, roads and bridges, schools, energy and government services. The fundamental question is, at the end of the day, what do P3s bring to the table for public capital that other forms of public sector engagement with the private sector do not? You must identify the synergy in the venture. Two plus two equaling four is not worth doing. As a practitioner, here are some tips you might find helpful if you're asked to implement a public-private partnership. Treat the P3 development as a matter of public policy. Recognize that the engagement of senior civil service in the discussion is critical. Keep evangelistic rhetoric at bay. Expose failures and work to understand how or why projects fail to improve future projects. Do not allow the public sector unions to derail or monopolize the debate. However, it is important that you acknowledge where they have valid criticisms of P3s. Here are some significant components of the P3 action plan. Fully consider how you will craft and implement a strategy for each. And once having done that, develop an action plan to implement. The headings are education and mobilization, coalition and community partners, community mobilization, working with union trustees or pension plans, remember they have the funds, lobbying government, research where you coordinate and build your evidence, elections, remember elections play a role. The political philosophy of Plato and Aristotle often make a difference in whether or not a P3 will be on the table. And finally, learn with others around the world of organizations around the world dedicated to advancing the science of public-private partnerships. You can find out more about P3s by visiting some of the websites I have provided on the slides. They include the Canadian Council on Public-Private Partnerships, Partnerships BC, the Government of Nova Scotia, the U.S. National Council for Public-Private Partnerships, the United Nations Development Program. I hope you find this high-level overview podcast and the accompanying video and PowerPoints of some value when you encounter P3s. Remember, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king.